be our 27th year or something like that. Um, and, you know, we've, we've learned so much about our piece of land in that amount of time. And we've, we've done things to fix the land in so many different ways. Um, and sometimes we take a step back like this year a bit um, when we didn't have anybody to work, we, we kind of, <laughs> we got, we let the seed bank grow quite nicely this year. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we're, we're excited to be able to, to grow organic vegetables on a wholesale level. I mean, it's a real challenge. Uh, most people don't realize what it takes, but um, we also love our, you know, our farm stand and all the local, local people coming and, um, and we do our best to try to give you almost every product that you would want. Um, and some of them are really hard, so they might cost a little more, but uh, <laughs> that's the way it goes because we're not living in Florida. <laughs> so um, anyway. Um, we could tell them a, a little history too. Whoever wasn't here, I, we talked a little about it last year too, but um, so Tony's father, grandfather moved down here in 19... I think it's around 1950. 1950s. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember exactly long, but we've been here for about 60. I think we figured it was around 66 years now. So it was a dairy farm <clears throat> um, for many years until about 85. And then um, Tony's mom always grew some vegetables, like grew tomatoes. So they sold um, corn out of the barn. And when people would drive by and um, say, well, do you have any tomatoes or do you grow any cucumbers? <laughs> so she started growing a little bit more vegetables um, and selling them over there. And um, and then Tony has a, what do you have? An electrical engineering degree from um, Vermont Tech, um, but then also took some plant soil science classes at UVM and yeah, started growing vegetables in 95. So that's kind of the history. Yep. How did everybody's gardens do this last this last year? Does anybody want to talk about their trials and tribulations? <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, last couple of years, my root vegetables haven't done crap. And I don't know why. The tops come up and they, they look good but they just don't do anything. So specific, do, specific, do, do, yeah. Do you have, do you have, do you water your garden? Oh yeah, yeah, when? that's not a problem. Okay. And then the things to think about are, what's my soil texture? You know, yep. how hard is that ground? Um, what can I do to fix it? And that was gonna be one thing I, just wanted to like kind of just talk about at some point anyway because a lot of us here in Vermont we're going to have a lot of clay soils so <clears throat> you need you need to have a lot of calcium in your soil or it's really hard and impenetrable you also need organic matter in there too um, but by adding calcium you actually open the soil up and it, it'll it allow for rooting um, a lot better by increasing calcium in the clay soils. If you have, like, cause we do have a river valley um, and here on the farm, we have to decide is what's that soil and what's this soil. Um, there's a link somewhere on there that will explain how to do the ribbon um technique to figure out if you have the sand or the clay and if, i'll put it in the chat know. um there's one link in there right now for soil testing but i'll put that link in the chat before the end of this too um so either way if you take a glob of your soil and you put it in your hand you wet it down it's moist and you can squeeze it into a ball you already know there's and it's solid 
there's clay in there. Now, if you take it and you smush it through your hand and it comes out this side between your forefinger and your thumb, and there's a little piece that sticks out past your hand as you're doing it, then it's proven there's clay. And if that piece will stick out a long ways, that means you have a lot of clay. Mm -hmm. So the more clay you have, uh, the, it can be more problematic because you don't have any oxygen down there for rooting. Um, you need to get the soil to be more friable. So like, for instance, if you're trying to grow carrots, it's not gonna wanna go in that well. Um, and a lot of plants will struggle if it's too much clay. So by adding gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, you're gonna add the calcium that'll start to break it up. And there's, you know, the recommendations per year might be 300 pounds to the acre max. Um, Jeez, I think I was gonna say something. And so you wouldn't wanna put all 300 pounds on right before you plant it in the spring. If you're gonna try to get this soil better and better all the time, you're gonna put on half of that in the spring, half of that in the fall, and just constantly see how your soil's coming and continue to do soil tests because soil tests are gonna show you your progress. So before you, be, you, know, before you begin this growing season, best thing to do is to take a soil test. Once you have the soil test, then you know what your organic matter is, which is huge because without organic matter, you're not going to have nutrients available to your plant. Most things are going to, uh, most nutrients that are going to be necessary, like the phosphorus, potassium, um, nitrogen, you have to have them in a soil solution. If they're tied to the molecule of the soil and there's not enough organic matter in that soil, they won't move and they won't be able to be grabbed very easily by your plant you're trying to grow. So um, if you do have a very low organic matter soil, you want to maybe add some compost to just immediately get it really going in the right direction that first year. So um, if I was struggling last year growing stuff, I'd probably, I would put some calcium sulfate down. If I had the clay, I would uh, put some compost down on my land if I could, maybe an inch over the top or something like that, just to really get all the microbes and everything going in that soil. Um, I'd also add quite a bit of like SOPO mag, okay? which is potassium, magnesium, and sulfur. So what you've done is you've added potassium, which is essential for fruiting. You've also added magnesium, which is the second most, it's the second largest ingredient in your soil. And that's what your plants are looking for, okay? They're gonna need magnesium. They're also gonna need sulfur, which is in there. And that sulfur, this is gonna get complicated. I know, let um, them make sure they're following along. Does that, does all of this make sense? <laughs> does this helping your question? Yeah, I, but years before I didn't have the problem of growing the root vegetables. And this spring, uh, sorry, this fall, I thought it might be lacking because I really haven't added stuff the last couple of years, but this fall I added some more fresh llama manure and some hay right over the top. But I hadn't had the problem that I had in the past. I mean, I didn't have the problem in the past, just the last couple of years. Yep. So, if, so you might have less and less availability of nutrients depending on how much organic matter you have and what your soil test would tell you. Um, the soil test is the most important thing. You could have lots of phosphorus or uh, different nutrients, but if they're not available, if your cation exchange is really low, or it's called the CEC on the soil test, 
is low. That's why you want that sopo mag in there because you want um, more anions. I was going to explain that. So phosphorus, which would be in the compost, it would be in any kind of manure like you just put on. Um, so you're, you've added the phosphate for sure. But the sulfur is tougher to get. So if you add the sopo mag or if you add Epsom salt for magnesium, any type of sulfate, then you're going to add another anion, which makes the soil react. There's the chloride ion, which you also can add uh, by using kelp meal. And you can, you can, I shouldn't even say this probably because I don't want you to overdo it, but you can add very small amounts of salt to get your chloride ion out there. And so if you have more ions floating in the solution, your soil will become more alive. It'll have more reactivity. Um, and if it does, then it'll be exchanging elements. The hydrogen moves, the calcium moves. Um, and if your soil's beat up, let's say that you couldn't add any compost, they don't let me add compost. So I have to add, I only add like banding. I band my fertilizer, which is a 534, 5% 5 nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, NP, potassium, and then phosphorus. So NPK. So um, I'm not getting a lot there. And, you know, diversity in your soil is is what you need. Um, if you're not going to have a lot of organic matter, you can add at the very beginning of the season. I'm give, trying to give you as many ideas to think about here as possible. Um, if you understand what soil balancing is, you have about 70% calcium in your soil, you have about 10% magnesium, and then you have five or three percent potassium, um, God, I'm not sure, phosphorus and potassium. And um, so all those little micronutrients, macronutrients, let's call them, need to be there in your soil. So there's times when if I want my yields to go up and I had the time in the spring, I would take some gypsum um, about 50 to 100 pounds to the acre. I would also add a little bit of magnesium, maybe up to 50 pounds an acre, which is probably more than it needs. Um, I'd put Sopo Mag in my spreader, so I would have potassium for my crop. And I would probably put that in at at least 100 pounds or more per acre, depending on the crop's needs. Where can they get some of this stuff? <clears throat> um, it's at all the, all the hardware stores, like, you know, the uh, Farm and Garden or Agways will have nutrients like this. Uh, North Country Organics is like a place where you can get a lot of different organic sources, which they're in Bradford. Um, Oliver Seed in Milton has very similar products too. Does the Farm and Garden have that stuff? Farm and Garden buy stuff through Oliver Seed so they can get whatever you need, even if they don't have it. Um, those are things that keep me successful. I know um, the more I till the land, the more my organic matter is going to drop. So I'm trying to cover crop right next to the crop because I got to try to hold my organic matter the best I can, especially when I'm not using compost to bring it back up. Um, and I'm and, and the other thing about gardening too, if you have a big enough spot where you can have part of your garden one year and then take a year off on another part, that can also be a real big help in controlling weed, weed seeds and stuff like that. And also pulling nutrients back up that you put down on the soil the year before by using the cover crop. And the cover crops, the thing with cover crops are they're actually, capable of pulling the nutrients out of the soil 
because if you leave the cover crop long enough, your soil is more alive. So the more you till your garden, the less alive it is. So if every single year it's tilled, 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 it's, it's kind of dead out there. Um, you're killing even the worms, you're killing a lot of things out there. But if, if uh, you can keep forms of bacteria and fungi alive in your garden, whether it's in your wheel, in your uh, walkways or whatever, then your soil is more alive. And then enzymes can form and enzymes are what strip the nutrients back out of the soil. And usually, um, if your soil, especially if your soil has been an agricultural field ever, there's going to be a lot of nutrients available in it that you could get back out without even buying them. I talk too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell he's been doing it for 27 years. <laughs> but I can tell a, uh, a success story. Uh, last year when you guys did this uh, Zoom thing, uh, I asked a question about the three sisters, a sort of uh, Native American uh, growing of corn, beans, and squash together. And we had a little bit of a discussion, and I had a little bit more with a few folks afterwards. Well, anyway, I gave it a shot last year on an upper garden I have in Hyde Park, and uh, it was wildly successful. It was, it was amazing. Uh, couple things uh, I did learn though, my hills of corn, uh, the corn wasn't quite strong enough to take the pole beans, even though I got the corn started first, uh, but the pole beans were still a little bit too heavy. I, I love this uh, rattlesnake uh, dried beans, you can eat them fresh or dry, and they started to knock them over. I mean, production was still good, but uh, it was just sort of a mess. So I think next year I'm going to put a pole in the middle of the, of the, the hill of, of corn, and uh, then plant the beans a little bit later, maybe and around them. But my, uh, my winter squash was terrific and, and pumpkins. And I didn't have any coons come into my corn. Now, I might have just been lucky on that. Uh, so but <laughs> there was some coon tracks in the area, but I didn't see any right up at that garden. I'm pretty far away from water up there. But I got an amazing crop of all that stuff. So I'm, I'm going to do that again. And I did take your advice on... Uh, on um, uh, cover crop also, and uh, that probably helped a bit. And I did have some extra compost to throw up there. But uh, anyway, it was I was really happy with that. That's great. Fantastic. Can I ask a few questions. Yeah. Sorry, right. is it okay to ask questions? Yes. Yeah, that's Perfect. yeah, that's the whole thing. Super. <laughs> um. So. I, I was listening to what you were saying about the soap pole mag, and I was wondering how lime plays into that because I've heard that lime is supposed to be one of the things that does also release um, some things into the soil. And I saw that on the chat, there was someone asking about where to get your soil tested. And I wanna add on to that when you're testing your soil, it seems like from bed to bed, um, from getting to know my garden, there's some beds that do really well with some crops. And if I rotate them, they might not do as good in other places. So when I'm doing a soil test, I'm very confused about if I would need to have to test each bed because otherwise I feel like I'm not getting a true reading to the garden because some parts of it are, are react very differently to the same crop planting. Yeah, it, it, you could have, you know, maybe when you made the beds, you added different things. Um, or is the soil texture is a little different in one bed or another. I mean, anything is possible. I mean, the more information you have, the better off you are. Um, yeah. But it is hard when you're talking small scale. Like when I do my soil tests in my greenhouses, I take about 20, 25 samples, like the little cores at six inches deep. So that's a lot of soil. And if, depending on how long the bed is, um, you know, if it's a hundred and something feet long, you can still get 25 cores. Um, but um, you, you know, if it's only 10 feet long, you're gonna feel like, oh my gosh, they take all the soil out of my bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, if, 
if you continue to add little bits of say calcium, like check the soil texture again, go back to soil texture and, and see if they're all similar just for the heck of it. And if you think they're in the clay zone, they're too clay, no, nope, they're too sandy. So if they're too sandy, then it's the opposite. So instead of adding more calcium to loosen the soil, you actually add a little bit more magnesium to tighten the soil and retain the moisture a little bit more. Um, it tightens it. That's- Is calcium so, lime? Calcium is just an element, but lime has calcium in it, but the lime will react and it will drop your pH. So if you've put a lot of lime, so even if you put lime down this spring, it probably doesn't do anything till next year. So if you want calcium, I would recommend gypsum because it's a very simple molecule. It's just calcium and sulfur. And you need sulfur because you need that extra reactivity to accelerate movement in that soil. And <clears throat> most soils, okay, after I grew vegetables here for even five to 10 years, my sulfur was very low and my yields were going down dramatically. And then I started supplementing nutrients and I didn't do it every year, but I could see, oh my gosh, my sulfur's going down. This is the time to put it on. You know it's low. And especially after that soil test, if you do two, you do one, you do five soil tests, it doesn't matter. Sometimes I do up to 26 soil tests. So it cost me like an arm and a leg. Um, but it's, it's important to really define the growing area. <clears throat> and so then you know what, where you want to go toward to make it better. Um, and like if yours is a sandy soil, I would not be surprised if you, if you don't need Epsom salt or Sopomag because Sopomag is going to increase your flat, your fruiting ability. Like, let's just say you grow a couple summer squash in one and um, you grow potatoes in another one, you're going to need a ton of potassium in there. Like when you look at parts per million, that's how they kind of talk about it in science. It's like 250, 300 parts per million per year of phosphorus and potassium for potatoes. It's like one of the heaviest feeders uh, as vegetables go. Um, and if you're trying to go winter squash, uh, peas, anything that's flowering and producing that summer squash zucchini, it, it, you need that potassium to keep on allowing it to, to be able to create more flowers. And, and then you, you may need to supplement it a little bit with nitrogen. If you see it get going downhill and give it a little boost halfway three quarter, you know, through the season, if you want it to go to the end, like this year was an amazing year. We picked summer squash and zucchini in the end of October. I stripped the leaves, the dead ones. I mean, these vines were getting really long and they were all getting really diseased. And I finally was just, I've never done this before, but I'm going to go rip all the bad leaves off because there's no airflow. And next thing you know, I have great summer squash and zucchini again. And I did put a little nitrogen and some potassium. So it pushed it, you know, it wasn't ideal growing in September and October, but it still did really better than it's ever done. Um, and Kim, you're, you're muted. Yes, I, I was just laughing because my squash, to get, get, I get a few squash and then the squash bugs take over no matter how, how many eggs I take off of it. But I do have a follow up because I would love to use more of the compost that um, that we have here. And I'm nervous about leek moth carryover. So we grow a lot of onions in a different area than Johnson because in Johnson we've been um, hit hard by leek moth. And 
the when I'm using the onions, I'm throwing the scraps into our compost, and I'm wondering if the compost is getting hot enough to make sure that anything that might have been um, carrying over from the leak moth larva, it, it would be killed. And there's not a sure bet on that, is there? Well, I think from what I know about the leak moth, it's like it's going to do its damage and eventually it's going to go lay its eggs not right there but in the tall grass around your garden or along the edge of the field that's where supposedly they go and what you have to think about with the leek moth you're you know just like me you have to think about when it's going to fly <clears throat> and you're going to have to make some kind of spray application you buy the trap, you figure out when they fly, and then you have to lay it, you have to spray to kill the larvae. Okay, so it's tough because they, like I've had UVM here like multiple years and, and they were doing the counting. They would trap every week and tell me, oh my gosh, you're, you're way above the threshold right now. If you don't spray now, it could be devastating. And I lost all of my leeks. Um, I basically gave up growing leeks past like August, uh, probably mid-August, because if I wait till the next flight happens, there'll be nothing to pick. It, every single one will have a hole through it. Um, you know, when we're picking our onions, in that time period and and shallots and you know we're still selling the last of them right now and we're still finding you know the leek moth where he he left his little red mark in the side and uh, so some of those are no good but um that's going to be a tough pest it's not really going to go away um and if you could move things around i'm not sure how long they stay in that area before they kind of burn themselves back out because they don't have a host six years swede midge takes four to five years so if you ever were going to grow broccoli again you got four to five years between fields <laughs> um let's see yeah, I mean, everything has like its period of time. Um, so. But to get back to my question, if, you, if I'm putting scraps of onions that have potentially um, have been leek mothed, is that something that I can use, assuming that the compost has done its work and or is it in there? Is there, it, it, does Lara live in the compost? Can it? I think it would that? live in your trash pile until it was composted, you know? Like if you got it, if you're putting in everything into a barrel and it's heating up real quick, then great. Yeah, but if you're just throwing it on the ground, like most people do. No, then... it's in the compost. It's in the compost. I just don't know if our compost has generated, a, you know, it's out freezing right now. So I don't know if our compost is generating enough heat to kill it. So I guess that's the question. I'll have to dig into the compost and see if it's. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I'm, I'm not sure. That's that's a good question. It's going to depend on like how much you really work that compost and flip it and stuff. So, and the other one I know I'm being a very very usurping here, but I yeah, hopefully it's helping other people too. Um, for cover crops, um, we've been doing oats because, in the, they seem to get killed and then disintegrate a lot quicker than winter rye. We tried to, we had to turn and and you know manipulate versus some. We, we're looking for a cover crop that's healthy but also can. Um, not be so much work in the spring, especially if we're early planters, you know, if we want to get beets and carrots and, and, and things that we can plant early. So ideas for cover crops that are nutritious, that are, are oats nutritious, or are there other ideas that you have about what we could do for cover cropping that kind of disintegrate and don't have to be tilled? That, I've been using oats. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it all depends on when you're going to till it. You know, like the early, like yeah. you said, really early stuff, then mm -hmm. you're, you need to have it kind of cleaned up. And if you, if you've got stuff that you're going to plant, say in June, then you could till that rye, but you have to plant the rye so it doesn't grow too big. And then you need to till it early, real early in the spring. 
So, or it will become overwhelming, especially in a garden plot. Um, and there's a lot of different things you can do in a garden plot. Um, I mean, it's still, it's great to have alive things out there. You know, if you have life, you have enzymes, they're breaking the soil down, they're helping you out. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on with like people doing raised beds and permanent beds and not moving the soil. Um, but when you do that, I think you really have to get that bed set. And there's this book called The Ideal Soil. So if I was gonna do that, I think I would try to get my soils as close as I could um, and then not move them again and then just probably add stuff to the surface and plant in the top, maybe using like tarps to kill everything or burning. Um, just, you know, that's a whole different subject, but you're welcome. Is there some more questions out there? Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering uh, why you can't use compost on your gardens. Is that something to do with a uh, organic certification? Oh, it, it's for nutrient management. So we can't use that much phosphorus because our plants aren't taking the phosphorus up. So if I wanted to use compost, I'd have to find a way to band it. You know, I'd have to get it dry enough so I could get it to fall in the line where my plants are going to lay. Because the only other way I've ever been able to put it down is with like those spreaders with the chain spreaders where it's coming out flying everywhere. And so Heather Darby told me I, if I was going to UVM. For, yeah, Heather, Heather Darby from uh, yeah, UVM extension. She's the person that I did the nutrient management plan with probably around 2003 or four. And, you know, she just, made us look at what we're doing. These are the crops, these are the uptakes on the crops. And if, if they're not taking anything, then you can't put anything down there. So wraps are, can you tell them it's what- It's not wraps. Or what is it? So we're, we're under, um, so it all kind of goes back to keeping the lake clean. We're, we, we're under a lot of different, um, what do you call them? Because of the size that we are, we're not huge, but we're big enough to fall under Except being regula regulated by the state on what we can put on our fields and what we can't. We're, we're, you know, if as a home gardener, you can do just about anything you want, but we're here in the river valley. So they're more worried about runoff, leaching, because we're in more erodible soils too. So on your gardens, adding the compost is like a way to add life. Like you, you can do almost everything wrong. And if you put one more inch of compost and till it in, you're back in the game. Like nothing ever happened, you know, like no soil test, nothing. You're, you're rolling. So, um, you know, but I still would recommend doing a soil test and then at least you know where you're at, you know, and, um, and, and understanding that soil texture so you can understand, should I have more calcium or should I have a little less calcium? Um, they're all those things are, they're all important. And you know, the micronutrients after a while, like if, if you've got this part of it figured out and you're dialed in with your soil on the macronutrients, then, and you still have a problem here and there, then it usually comes down to like, the lack of the nutrients traveling to the plant where well, that can be like it could be lack of iron it could be lack of cobalt it could be lack of boron like so some of these other little things that we wouldn't even think about but are in different products that we can just spread right on there um like kelp meal for instance or I did mention this once, you can actually put salt on your garden, but it's got to be tiny about um, tiny amounts because you don't want to put too many chloride ions out there. Um, but a little bit of chloride isn't 
bad. It is going to, just like the sulfur ion leach through because it's, it's going to break apart and get caught somewhere else. Um, yeah, having, balancing your soils or, you know, that, that's one of the, the things. Um, I don't know. Did you ever take a picture of this? I did. I also, I put it in the chat. I know our lighting is terrible here, but it is in the chat too. It's, um, uh, where did I put it? It's up in there somewhere. Um, the Ideal Soil by Michael Estera. Um, if you can get that, Tony, is he's always looking at that book. So um, somebody did ask, oh, Kim also said, what's the best places to get compost that's safe and good? Safe and good. I mean, I, I mean, we, <clears throat> we buy all of our compost from Vermont Compost. Um, you can buy it by the bag. But, you know, if you know someone who has good manure and you know what they're mixing it could just be horse manure and shavings um it's compost it's got the nitrogen it's gonna have the phosphorus it's gonna have a lot of micronutrients from you know especially if the animal is digesting like a grass because those micronutrients were taken up into that grass and then they're being eaten and you know digested and turned into enzymes and muck and next thing you know it's growing your garden um so and it's versus it, cow versus horse cow um, versus different horse. animals I, mean, I don't think it matters much i mean i used horse manure on this sandy field up well it's right up it's up the footbrook road it, it used to be i call it the dayton field but it's dorcas jones field when i very first started i uh, went to pete cole's he let me fill my truck as many times as I wanted because he didn't want to clean the barn. So we were cleaning the barn for him. <laughs> and then we would take it and we would just, you know, someone would drive the truck and we'd just throw it sideways like crazy landscapers and get a little tiny bit everywhere. And we had some phenomenal yields uh, for a couple years by using that. Um, of course, that's a lot of work. So eventually that was a little, you know, we grew a little bit and then you're like, how could we possibly do all that with our little pickup and, uh, and Pete's little pile. So, um, but um, the cow manure, like when I was a kid, my mother, my father would just bring the, the spreader and it would be everywhere. And we, we had phenomenal gardens, you know, every two years, I think he would do that. And, now you wouldn't be able to be organic and just spread solid manure um, unless you let it sit for three months so you'd have to put it there till it in and then next year use it or something but but um that's just one of the organic standards and you know you probably wouldn't have any problems as long as you didn't have any you know you weren't you know, a cancer patient or something um, that, you know, some weird bacteria, one in a million instance, you know, but when we were kids, we were pulling the stuff right out of there, not even washing it, eating it, you know, in the field, eating the radishes and carrots with dirt on them and whatever was on the dirt. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, in today's world, we have to use compost. We have to know that it was heat treated, um, all those things, or we have to actually count it as a manure. Um, just that's the standards now. Um, but if I was the homeowner, I probably wouldn't be all that concerned. But I have to be concerned about every person, if even if they're you know immune compromised or whatever. So like, hopefully, don't ever have any chance of harming anyone from here to Florida for all I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's see if anybody else has any questions. I have a question. You go, okay. Leslie, you go. <laughs> I, I, I'm, um, I don't know what my internet connection is and whether you can hear me because I'm uh, in front I'm in front of the school because I don't have any internet at home. So um, 
I my problem is I have very sandy, gravelly soil, and I've built up a lot of organic matter with my two horses and all of they give me. But my problem and mulching as well. But my problem is now slugs and snails. Okay. Um. So now you've and did you so you had a gravelly, sandy, gravelly soil, but now it's got a lot of organic matter and it's a black soil. Um, probably right. Or I'm it, sorry, you, you cut out there for a minute. Now I've got I've got good fertility and very and very good friability. I don't till anymore. But now with keeping a layer of mulch on most everything, I find that the snails and slugs have kind of taken over. Yep, and that's because of the mulch, because it's just easy to live there. Um, they love moisture. And if you already had a sandy soil, um, you know, it, it does want to dry out. Um, but believe it or not, if you had like a little drip line, one drip line in that sandy soil and you watered for 45 minutes every day, um, probably wouldn't have that slug problem. Water like right off the bat or sometime in the morning. And you know, the mulch is holding the slugs. I mean, it's kind of like a rhubarb patch for instance. You know, once you get full canopy or summer squash where there's just absolutely no sunlight getting in there, the slugs will start to come in and they'll be able to, you know, breed and you'll end up with lots of them before you know it. You so you can also try to drown them. Um, you know, if it's tiny scale, you can put like a little water tub on the edge of the ground, just slightly in the ground so they'll crawl into it because they want the water and that's where they'll die. Um, the old beer can method probably would work. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can do it, I'm sure. Uh, just try to keep it, you know, if say once a week, let's say that you wanted to keep your mulch, well, maybe once a week, you're gonna have to go out and move your mulch around then. Um, with us, you know, we're using black plastic in a lot of places because we don't have the time. We know that it's going to be a little more successful. It's not going to allow the slugs probably to be there as easily because this plastic's going to dry out quick, but it's going to hold our moisture in the ground. So like if you're worried about it drying out, you, you could just take a little piece of black plastic and, and tighten it to the ground. Um, with a shovel, um, you know, you work one side at a time and just make sure it's taut and, um, and if you then don't plant want to use into plastic, it. They could use like a black uh, fabric too, right? Okay. Yep. yep. You could use right. those that woven fabric or something too. But yeah, okay, the mulch great. is definitely going to encourage the slugs and stuff. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. I've got a, a question for you. Um, we. Uh, we really like our salad greens um, and uh, would love some hints on how to keep them coming. Okay. Well, what type of salad greens do you grow? Um, I've, I've been mostly using the um, high, high mowing, uh, hardy, no, high mowing, uh, it's a mix from high mowing. Yeah. Um, can't like remember. Salad, so is it a, a mescaline mix or is it, um, or is it like small heads that you cut or? No, it, it's um, leaf lettuce. It's a mix of leaf lettuce. So it doesn't form any heads. Okay. So it's just the smaller stuff and you have to make sure you keep weeding in between that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, if, if you, get a cutting off it, you re-weed it so you don't have any anything there, you don't cut down too far on the plant, it will send up more shoots. Okay. Um, so it can continue to come back. Um, the toughest part is if it's like going to be super hot and super dry, it may want to bolt. But if you're in like a nice temperate time, if you add mm -hmm. just a little bit of nitrogen, right after you weeded it, it's gonna have another really great flush because what nitrogen does is it creates the top growth, the green. 
if I want my tomato plant to have a big stem, like I see it getting small toward the end, if I add a little bit of nitrogen, that stem will start to increase again and my plant will be a little healthier because I maybe didn't have enough nutrients there to begin with, or I could only produce so many tomatoes with my fertility. Um, but to try to push my tomatoes from, from June 20th until October, I have to keep adding a little something when I see there's a problem or assume that every couple of weeks uh, I'm going to, I'm going to need just a little tiny bit of nitrogen and it's a tiny, tiny bit. You don't want to overdo it. What can they, is that sold under a name that they can find at um, Abishan's or the farm and garden? Well, I mean, we're using organic nitrogen, which, you know, it's usually a mix of what's called Chilean nitrate and different meals like feather meal and um, there's different meals mixed in and but we we buy this 10 zero zero it's you know because of feather meals I think 15 percent nitrogen uh, leather leather feather meal and uh, I'm not exactly sure what else they have in there but it's a 10 zero zero product and you you're not if, if you were to use just the nitrate you might kill your plants. But this stuff has got so much meal in with it and a, just a few of the little nitrate pellets that when you spread it around, um, it's not gonna be devastating because you could easily kill your plants with say, if you had just a conventional fertilizer and you were trying to spread it through your garden, if you are gonna do conventional, you could kill your plants because it is so much stronger. It can be toxic to it. Um, you know, or even just burn the edges of the leaves and ruin the crop. Even if it doesn't kill the crop, it could be, it could be too much. So a slower release nitrogen after picking would get you at least one more picking, maybe two more pickings. It just depends on the time of the year. And if you can, have you found that, I know if I pick a shadier place where there's not as much light, I might get a slower It'll stay around a longer amount of time. And one idea is to, if you're a home gardener anyways, to plant something that's gonna grow up and shade it. So if I plant my cukes and they're growing up uh, like a fence, then the lettuce is getting more shade and then it's not gonna bolt as quick. So being able to layer them with um, plants that um, might give them some shade and allow them to not bolt as quickly. Yep, yeah. And definitely that you want as many strategies as you can in the summertime. You know, and, and it's hard to tell when summer is around here. I mean, last year it was May and June, then July was no summer anymore. <laughs> um, so it's like, it's pretty confusing, but uh, you know, being able to make sure you get the water to it, but salad greens are gonna be tough if, if it's 90 or 100. Um, but in the fall, if you have a type that doesn't, it's got like a downy mildew resistance, then you can go late into the fall with those. Um, and in the early spring is always seems to be the best time to grow lettuces and spinach. They just do great. You can usually pick that those first spinaches maybe three times. And all you had to do is, like I said, just add a little bit of nitrogen and in three, four days, it's ready to pick again. So I hope that helped. So I have a question. How do you keep squash bugs away with, besides getting the egg masses off the leaves, you know, taking off those leaves? I tell you, they're the bane of my existence sometimes. They're tough. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like, for me, of course I have all these, I have sprayers, right? So I should be able to spray them. What, and I try to use the sprayer, but it doesn't really work that great in summer squash and zucchini with those squash bugs and i feel like picking them off is pretty much impossible there's so many of those little gray tiny things wandering around right and but the thing is when they come out they're almost all on one plant they're right there usually on one plant there could be a thousand of them and so if i had my my little pump up sprayer 
in the evening with some Pyganic, and you just spray it on there, it'll just burn them all and they'll all be gone. But I need to go with my hand sprayer because they're always on the underside of the leaf. So if I spray with my boom sprayer, I might get some of them, but there's still going to be a whole bunch of them. And it doesn't take that many before they suck the holes right through the fruit. And then you get the little brown spots on them. So, um, but the Pyganic is the organic way. And if you mix it with a little bit of soap and oil, it sticks better. And those leaves on summer squash and zucchini are tough. Um, it's, they're not gonna, it's not gonna bother them. Just don't do it when it's sunny. Because that it could have a phytotoxic effect. It's the same thing as if, let's say in the fall, you have a lot of mildew coming. Well, you can use peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and you will kill that, that mildew. It starts to kill the mildew. You'll even see it if you, like I'll have to do more than one application, um, but it, the mildew will start to run off the leaf from the peroxide. It's, it's trying to kill it. I mean, there's other things like sulfur that can get rid of it too. I um, think the copper might work too, but um, yeah, just it's sometimes it's all about when is the pest the easiest to kill? How, what's our easiest way to, to get it done? Um, you know, like for potatoes, for instance, when I have my little patch at the beginning, I'm willing to go pick off the bugs at first because they're all walking. They can't fly. They're all walking and they're walking from the last patch. So I'll battle with it for a while, like by hand. And then after a while, I'm like, I can't win anymore. It's just too overwhelming every day. So then I'll go to my next mode of action, you know. Um, I mean, if you can get your plants big and then just look for that, that cluster where those, those little, they look like little gray spiders wandering around there. So I'm sorry that they're here. I don't like them either. <laughs> Can we talk about um, Swede midge? And I had some broccoli and Brussels sprouts that got really stinky and looked like they were rotting. And I don't know, I had covered all my breast cases in, in the beginning and then thought, oh, they're fine now. And I took it off. So what are the symptoms of it? Um, if we plant in a different bed, are we going to be okay? Or is it like, or if we think we might've had it, then we can't do anything with the garden. Thank you. You can like, so we're, we still grow at the very beginning of the year, we're growing, um, two varieties of broccoli. Um, and the real key with the Swede midge is, can you get your plant to get to full size? That's the first step. So if you put it in early-ish in May, then it's gonna grow pretty well. Um, you know, it's a good, good growing time normally. It's not usually too super hot. Um, what I do is as soon as I plant my transplants on broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, that's the, those are the only ones I really do. Um, I'll just, I use a netting that the Swede midge, it's fine enough so the Swede midge can't get through it. And I leave that on until I wanna go pick. Yeah. And as far as Brussels sprouts go, I usually will leave it on until sometime the beginning of September, mid-September, and then I'll pull it off. And, you know, they're not always loving it under there. It's not going to be the best growing, but it at least gives us a chance because if I take off the cover and let's just say it's a Brussels sprout and it has like the flowering spot. That's what the Swede midge does. It lands on the flowering on the terminal and it lays its eggs and then it rots that. So Swede midge is gonna be, if you get it in your field, in your garden, somewhere near there, you got four more years before it might be gone. And um, 
it's tough. That's why I've been trying. I moved from one side of the farm to the other side of the farm, then up to the Dayton Field, up Footbrook Road. And now I'm going to be back to, I'm going to call it hell this year down here because there's no way by August it's going to be fun to pick anymore. Um, you know, broccoli is a early season thing, white cauliflower is early season, and, and you will still have losses. Um, even with netting, but you will get, if you're just trying to grow some so you can freeze it, you can still get your crop and freeze it, but you got to do the earlier varieties with, with a fine netting that the Swede midge can't get through. And so it's not coming from the soil, it's coming from somewhere else. Like the Swede midge is, it comes out of the soil. So let's say, let's say you have it in one spot in your garden. Those midges are going to fall out of the plant into the ground right next to that plant. And some of them, or let's say 90% of them will reemerge. And let's say 10% of them will, depending on the generation, there's going to be maybe three or four generations a year. So let's say there was one Swede midge, it could lay up to 100 eggs. So you've got a hundred Swede midges on the first guy, <laughs> then those all drop into the soil. So then a month later, you've got a hundred flies. Wow. You know, 50 to hundred. And then it's going to go to, you know, whatever, a lot, a lot, a, a ton more than that, you know, cause now you've got so many more. Um, so by the time you get to the end of the season, it's really hard because now you've got tens and hundreds of thousands of them that could be emerging. And, um, you know, even in kale, at some point, it's just like they've hit the growing point. It's turned it brown. The leaves are getting stunted. The leaves won't even look like a kale leaf sometimes. Like on a bad infestation, you'll have three to six leaves that are like distorted, not even wrinkly, like completely different than you've ever seen, but it didn't kill the plant. So you can strip those, take the good ones, put them in your bunch and, but you're, you're now you're not really making money if you're doing wholesale, but you're, you know, you can still keep the, you know, the local people going, but um, anyway. And they don't get Average. killed by the winter, the winter, like so the next growing season they're, they're still they're, they're still in the soil or no yep there's there's a percentage of them that don't come back out that just pupate let's call it wait for next year so the next year you're gonna have way more right off the bat than you had the first time and then then by the end of the second season wow you thought things were bad last year Woo, you didn't see nothing and so the other thing you can do, really the only thing that can discourage them is constantly spraying every single week, um, using garlic spray to try to confuse them as to where they are. But if you don't spray to kill one, eventually there's gonna be 10,000. So, you, you know, it's gonna be kind of a lost cause after a certain point. Um, but if they're not really building up around you, then thank God. Um, but if you have yellow mustard, anywhere, if you've ever, ever seen a yellow mustard plant on your farm, on your house, by your house, you probably already have them because that's any type of brassica plant, they're going to hit it. Radishes, turnips, they're going to hit those. They're going to hit everything. So um, it's a pretty bad pest. And I'm supposed to go to an, a seminar in February and we'll see if there's anything new, but I don't know. We'll keep our fingers crossed. If they, anyway, I've been working with them for a long time at UVM, but let us pray Yolanda figures it out. <laughs> One thing I've, I've discovered on uh, potato, uh, Colorado potato beetle, if I uh, plant my potatoes really late, uh, I don't get the, a real bad infestation and I can usually keep up by knocking them off uh, and killing them. Uh, I still get them, but not nearly so bad as if I put it in, you know, right when I plant the rest of my garden. 
it's true. It's very true. And that's why I put my early planting in with just a few rows, just so I can get some early potatoes for the farm stand. You know, I know I'm not going to yield that much out of there, but then my next ones, I'm hoping that the beetles have been wandering toward this other patch. Does they, they can tell it's there somewhere and they're moving toward it, but they keep emerging from that same piece where they were last year. So if you're near that piece, they're gonna travel wherever they can. Oh my God, there's a potato plant over there. Oh, this, I smell eggplant over there. We're heading that way. So, I mean, they're gonna go toward those crops. And the best thing is at first they can't fly. Um, but after they have babies and they can fly and then it's, you know, so if you can, if you don't have another potato planting, there's nowhere to go and they're going to have to die, right? There's just nothing for them to do. That's a very smart way to do potatoes. Um, it, it, you know, sometime in June when that, the, you've got the population down, um, it definitely, can make your life a lot easier as far as that goes. And last year you couldn't really kill them. All I had was neem and piganic and I couldn't kill them. Um, and then trust used to work. It worked for a few years, but now it doesn't work. So, you know, they've evolved past the fermented bacteria now. And really the only thing that might kill them is a strain of the, the bacteria, the BT, uh, Christaki, whatever stuff. So that like is one product that I can buy called Trident, but last year that nobody worked, there was none of that, zero. So it was impossible to keep it under control. I sprayed every single week to marginally knock them down. Like it didn't do much. I mean, an hour after I spray Piganic, you could go out and lick the leaf probably, you know, like it's not hurting anything, you know, it just doesn't do anything after just a little bit of time. It's, I mean, it works and then it's worthless. And then if the sun came out, it degrades it. So, but you're doing a good job. Great idea. Timing can mean everything in vegetables. I was wondering uh, on the um, uh, powder they sell, it, it advised when you're planting legumes to help fix nitrogen in your soil. How important is that? I seem to kind of not do it most of the time, but uh, I wonder, am I missing the boat? It's probably not that big of a deal because you're just doing a couple feet, you know, it's, you're, I mean, you know, if, if you've got time to burn and you don't forget this year to go pick up a little teeny package of it sure put some on your seed and throw it in there but I don't think you're going to gain that much out of like a green bean patch or a, you know if you're going to grow vetch and try to cover crop and and try to get the maximum nitrogen down you know out of that cover crop maybe it's more worth it doing that maybe i don't know if maybe it's helpful in field peas or something you know but uh, i don't do it all the time so i'm you know i'm not going to say that it's something you have to do by any means i've done it before and then there's times that i just don't do it i'm just kind of overwhelmed usually so if i have to go find that and make sure my guy does everything right in the right place, number of rows, and he put the inoculant on, which now hopefully doesn't degrade the seed because I'm going to keep the seed probably from week to week or and continue to plant. Um, there's always something, but but hey, if you can do it, it's only going to help. After listening to you, Tony, I feel like we've got it really, really easy <laughs> with our garden. <laughs> well, sometimes, I mean, it's it it matters. It like I I can't fail, so I have to come up with a solution. Um, and in the garden, you're always going to get something. You may not get everything. Um, and it if you go on vacation at the wrong time, you could lose 
more than you were hoping for. Um, if you have an automatic watering system on a timer for 45 minutes a day, nothing will probably ever die in your garden. <laughs> you can go away for a week or two, just have someone come pick it. <laughs> So back to the best place to get our soil tested. I, I put right in the chat, it's um, uvm.edu, it's, it's, it's the extension. If you Google soil testing in Vermont, um, yeah. that probably will be the first thing that comes up, but it is right in the chat. I put a link right in there. Um, okay. It's got kind of a long thing because of course, UVM has quite the extensive website, but um, but it's in there and that's who we use, right? For the most part. That's who we've been using lately. I mean, we've also sent our stuff to, there's a, there was a lab in Ohio we used cause it was, I think there were like $25 tests or $20 tests or whatever. I mean, they're all similar somewhere between 20 and I don't even know. I mean, who knows now? I mean, maybe it's changed, but, um, <clears throat> You just need, at the very least, if you can just do the basic test, macronutrients, soil pH, uh, organic matter, and it'll tell you how reactive your soil is, and that's called the CEC. And so, and then if you, you know, if you really love gardening and really, you know, the more you love it, like that ideal soil book is really can could be really helpful. Like if you're unwilling to fail, <laughs> if you're if you're gonna be, I am never gonna fail. Well, then you better get that book. The other book too that can help. Um, if you really really want to understand it, there's a a book that I was told to buy back in 1995, and it's called The Knots handbook for vegetable and agriculture. Let me just see if I can find it. Oh. It would be over that way, I think. Yeah, the UVM site too, when you when you go on the link, it's really, they really explain a lot on there. And they even have um, different contacts you can reach out to. UVM is pretty amazing. Like they're really super helpful. And you know, with even, you can even send like get a disease um you know we send them ziploc bags of leaves and they'll let us know like what <laughs> what we're looking at yep so there's also this other book called the knots handbook for vegetable gardeners or growers or whatever it says there um and that's that, put that it in the chat that literally tries to explain like in a conventional way how much potassium you need for that crop, how much potassium, how much phosphorus, how much nitrogen, just looking at things like, this is what the ideal yield will take. If you give it 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 75 pounds of potassium or whatever, you know, each crop is different. So it, it, it will actually help you understand it. Um, if you know if you're if you like numbers like i've always you know i was i went to be an electrical engineer so numbers are no big deal but um it's you know important to just understand the ratios and and then understanding your soil test and trying to manipulate that soil a little bit every year you don't want to manipulate it a lot in one year unless you don't want to use it this year. Then you can manipulate it a lot, but don't expect anything out of it. Just let it, you know, mineralize, change itself, um, and then go back to it the following year if, if, if that's how you would like to do it. But because um, it, you know, when you look at soil balancing, there's certain nutrients you just can't balance out in one year. It's just um, not possible. And you know, by next year, I can give you more recommendations or whatever, anything that I can do to help you guys. So, 
I'm starting to uh, think about uh, starting my seedlings here. A little optimistic, probably, at 25 below zero. But uh, <laughs> do you have any uh, sort of a chart? I know, you know, you look on the seed packages and they say, you know, three weeks before, you know, your normal end of frost and all that. But, you know, that, that's kind of a moving target, too, it seems to me. Do you have a set thing or, or any kind of a chart or what do you use? Oh, yeah, we we have a seeding chart. And, you know, we just keep manipulating it every year as to what we're going to try to grow and what kind of yields we want. Um, so for us, we don't start anything until February. And then we're mainly starting stuff at the beginning of February to graft. Um, and then we also, that's a good time to start your flowers. If you're going to do any flowers, it'd be you know, sometime in, in February, probably. I mean, certain ones you'd even want to do before February. Um, we don't really do many flowers, so it's a little less to heat. <laughs> if you're, you know, it's so cold this time of the year to try to fool around with uh, starting stuff. But I mean, we use lights in the barn to on heat mats just to germinate stuff under fluorescent lights and um, on other, you know, we have other types of lights in there and I, I would like to get some LEDs too, just to have more diversity in there. But um, let's see. And yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, if whoever really, really wants to become a professional gardener, the more record keeping you can take, you know, the more that you can have like a little, let's say you have a little clipboard from year to year, make it pretty simple. You're going to have, you, you put a seating chart together. If you really want to make your life easy, you figure out on another piece of paper, what your seed orders <laughs> normally looking like. That's what I do. So we have how many seeds are left compared to how many seeds we need. Um, you know, so then we, then we have another column for how much we're going to order. And then we're figuring out, oh no, we can't get that variety anymore. So it starts getting complicated. And then you come up with a solution and finally order the stuff. Um, and then having the seating chart with all of the numbers on it, like, you know, certain things, we might have 25,000 seeds or something that we're going to seed in the greenhouse. Um, I will tell you, don't wait too long this year, like everything else in the world. Um, there are things you're not going to find. So if you have some favorites, um, order I'd them order, early. I'd order your seeds now because there's already things we couldn't get. So we ordered them in December. So and there was stuff gone already. Mm. Yeah, I've already got mine. <laughs> it's already come. That's great. Good. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is about record keeping, you can learn from year to year. So you got one page for the seating chart. You got one page for your ordering, whatever you're ordering. Uh, another page for your inputs that you put down this year. Just if you had a year to year thing. And then if you had a field history, let's say you have permanent beds, bed one through, let's say you got 20 beds. You've got something different in each bed every year, cover crop this year. It just, all that does is outline it in your mind. You can say, all right, this crop likes to follow this crop. And I know right where it was every single year so that I can see if there was a trend where something was going wrong for whatever reason. Um, and then of course, you know, if you're a grower like me, then you also have to get an idea as to what you're gonna actually spray on the crop, if you're gonna spray anything, you know? And then trying to understand that, you know, because certain things are gonna be really important to you and not, and other things aren't important to you. You might not care if something gets diseased in the fall because you've moved on to some other crop already anyway. Um, you know, once you've had too much summer squash and zucchini, you could care less if the stuff dies out there. <laughs> but uh, 
and it, it's everything is so dependent on what you want and what your expectations are. And I, yeah, just be happy that it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, you know, you can come up with ways to get your food in the freezer and a certain window of time, like green beans, and you could do peas early, you could do that summer squash and make bread all winter. Um, I don't know, it's Vermonters, it just seems that's how it was when I grew up. There was canning and freezing. We always froze corn, we always froze green beans. My mother canned things, made pickled beets, um, pickles. So we had a lot of, it was, yeah. And then of course we had our potatoes stored in the corner of the cellar, unheated cellar, you know? And I'd tell people, we'd still be eating those things at Easter with eyes on them over a foot long, cutting the eyes off, just peel them. They're a little soft. You're not going to die. You're going to be just fine. <laughs> All right. I have to share my, my one success this year. I always try to figure out how, because I love kale, but no matter how you store it, freeze it, whatever, it usually doesn't hold that great. And I just opened up a container that I had steamed it um, and then packed it into water. The, steam, the water that it was, no, maybe I cold, I'm, I think I got it cold first. Anyways, I packed it into water and froze it in a container and it came out so green and so like alive looking compared to any other way I've tried. So, and, and it's, I actually could pull it out and use it for stuff, but you could also just dump it into a soup. But I just wanted to tell people who grew a lot of kale that that was really successful. So um, if you get a lot. I, I would think you could do it with some other greens too in water. Seemed like it held Joe, up. Joey, yeah, Joey cooks great. with, you know, she'll put it in eggs or she'll put it in, you know, sauces or meat look or not well, meat. Yeah, loaf I put it in lasagnas and every <laughs> and and even though it might not stay quite as green, but if if you take even just a Ziploc, those gallon Ziploc bags and you take the small leaves at the end of the year and just push them in there until you can barely shut that thing. Close it, throw it in the freezer. It will get a little dulled on the color, but the coolest thing about freezing it is when you reach in and you just take, take your hand, it just breaks off and it shatters. So you can, you can just shatter it across the whole, like, the casserole, just, just, just kind of chucking it in there. You're like, wow, I didn't even have to cut it. This is great, you know. And now you're still getting your calcium and some micronutrients, and and you didn't have to work hard. <laughs> so you you don't blanch it at all. You just put it in raw. Is that it? Just raw, right in the bag, and just make sure you know you really get the air out of it, seal it, and we usually we usually have two or three gallon bags in our freezer every year and actually we have about six pounds of it six, so six or maybe. seven pounds of it i have frozen in the this uh, year though you you guys used so we stored the stuff that you brought into the farm stand which doesn't have the ziploc yeah so it's not as green this year i don't think well i yeah it's i also we try to pick it after the first frost that way you're killing some of the bacteria well, it's sweeter. Yeah, it does that too. But yeah, I literally crumble it. It also goes in our smoothies every morning. So yeah, we, it's like my favorite thing. I'd be devastated if I didn't freeze it. So that's a great idea though, about with the water. I bet it definitely is Stays more consistent. But I noticed that in the bags that don't seal, it lost more color. Yeah. It's getting more freezer dried freeze dried than it was like when you had that zip lock. Anything that makes life easier for everybody. <laughs> I just have to tell you that uh, when you mentioned NKP, my soils professor in school, his initials were NKP. <laughs> He's very proud of it. <laughs> That's cool. We do a lot of um, 
Progro, which is just, it's really minute, right? It's like maybe 111 or 555 five for NPK. 534 five, or 543. It's 534 five, is the North Country's blend. Five, okay. Three. Um, and is and that if you were to get if you bought same place North Country or Farm and Garden probably has it and it's that ten zero zero. It's got some. It's got some of the quick release nitrogen, which yep. I mean, you put it down and a couple days later you can see it's greener. But because it's got those meals in there, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't look like a conventional fertilizer at all. It's, but it's got some little white pellets to help immediately get the crop going, but then it, it keeps it going for longer because the meals take longer to break down. Um, so I don't know, I, I love that stuff because it doesn't burn the vegetable. Okay. But if I throw the white pellets straight, which is 15, zero one or something i'm probably gonna wreck the whole freaking patch so i'll be like oh it burned the leaves oh this uh, oh now it's too hard to even bother with it the heck with it you know because you if it confuses your employee you're losing five ten dollars a pound out there you know it's like you're either barely making something or you're losing money that's what you find you either did it right or you did it wrong and there's no hope when you did it wrong so if you're doing pro grow would you also do that then are you saying that that would or is it you feel like pro grow isn't worth it to put pro grow is really worth it at the beginning because you need so when you put the pro grow down you're adding the nitrogen right there let's say like with us we band it right next to where the seeds are going to come up um so now as my crop is growing i have nitrogen and it's very slow release i have potassium and phosphorus which are the two most important things without phosphorus the thing that they go oh my god don't do it don't do it yet if you don't do it you're not going to have any roots so you can forget about growing vegetables so you got to put it down it's got to be available and like i said if you don't add compost to your garden eventually it's not available after one or two years there is no phosphate available it ties up in the soil um it's just the way it is um and that's why they used to always they put rock phosphate because they could see wow the yields are going way up rock phosphate but the problem was they put so much rock phosphate down that it got to the point of oversaturating the soil with the phosphate and it literally could finally leach through into the water so you know by doing either putting your compost or your fertilizer at your plant or in a band, you're not overdoing it. But if you, if you go out there with your spreader and, and there's like 10 bags on your tiny little garden, you know, I'd be in trouble. You won't get in trouble. No one's going to care, but you might have way too many nutrients for what you need. Might be a really lush garden that year. The weeds will grow well too. <laughs> But it's getting close to 5.30, so um, I guess I'd say, unless anyone has any more questions, we'll, we'll close out here. Any, any last questions? Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks very much, Joey and Tony, for doing this. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Very much. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. I hope everybody does fantastic this year yeah doesn't know what to do with it all let's bring it to the neighbors <laughs> sounds good oh, thank America you great again there <laughs> thank you very much thank you thanks everybody thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.